On April 19th, Friday morning, Israel carried out an attack against Iran. It was apparently a retaliation for Iran's massive drone and missile attack on Israel April 13th. On Saturday night, April 20th, it was reported that the United States intends to sanction an entire IDF unit. All have details and commentary. And finally, on Monday evening, the Jews around the world are going to celebrate the Jewish Festival of Freedom, Passover, in the midst of a war for our national survival. Well, some thoughts on that, on the meaning of that festival today. Coming up on Info. So Friday morning, Israelis woke up to the news that beginning at around 3.30 in the, in, uh, 3.30 in the morning, the I- IDF had carried out a strike against Iran that also included targets in Syria and Iraq. And the question immediately arose, uh, was this a symbolic strike? Was it an important move by Israel? Was it a display of weakness or of strength? After all, immediately after Iran attacked Israel with an unprecedented 300 missiles and drones on April 13th, the United States immediately began pressing Israel not to respond, or if we responded, to respond with some sort of a symbolic move that was going to, in any way, shape, or form, uh, harm Iran strategically, lest Iran respond by expanding its operations or its war against Israel, which, of course, it's carrying out presently on seven fronts, uh, first and foremost, Gaza, but also in Lebanon and Syria and Iraq and Yemen, um, and uh, now, of course, uh, from Iran itself. So um, the question was, is Israel going to actually respond in kind, which means a massive strike against Iran, or is it going to just sort of let matters uh, lie and just maybe uh, sound and light show? That's what the Americans wanted. That was what the international community, such as it was the G7, all of its member states were pressuring Israel to do. And so there was a real fear that maybe a little strike or a strike that would suit the United States would be worse than no strike at all, because it would show that the United States had so seized control of Israel's operational decisions that Israel wasn't able to do anything if the United States prohibited it from doing so. So what actually was hit in uh, on Friday night uh, by the IAF by the Israel Air Force and by Israel's missiles and etc. Um, well, we don't know all of the details, but we are beginning to understand some of them. And of course, we should say uh, that uh, Israel has not taken any responsibility for the strike in Iran or in Iraq or in Syria. As far as the official Israeli position is concerned, Israel has had no comment on what happened early Friday morning. Um, But uh, what has been widely reported in the Israeli media and in the international media is as follows. Uh, First uh, strike was in Damascus or in Syria, sorry, in the the Dara region and that Israel struck a radar station there. Dara in uh, in, uh, southern Syria, east of Israel, is actually the site of the beginning of the 2010 effort by the Syrian people to oust Bashar Assad from power. It's also an area that's populated by the Druze, a sect inside of Syria uh, that also, uh, whose brethren live in uh, the Golan Heights in Israel and in the Galilee in Israel. And they're aligned very much, particularly with their family in the Golan Heights and with some family in Lebanon as well. Um, And there was a lot of talk during the Syrian civil war that the Druze wanted to align with Israel in the hopes of actually ousting Bashar Assad. So I think it was symbolic both that the target chosen was in the Druze region of Syria, but also that the target that was struck was a radar station that would have or was beginning to alert the Iranians about the incoming Israeli jets. At any rate, it was hit. That was what was hit in Syria. What was hit in Iraq, according to, I think it was ABC News that was first publishing it, was a building in Baghdad that housed Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps officers who were apparently at that time uh, meeting uh, in Baghdad. And we should remember that uh, Israel has been attacked from Iraq almost daily uh, with cruise missiles from uh, Iranian-controlled Shiite militia in Iraq. And actually on Saturday, 
in a separate raid that it's not clear whether it was a raid or it was just an explosion inside of a base, but a base uh, that uh, belonged to one of these Shiite uh, forces that has been attacking Israel uh, at the behest of Iran. It's a massive ammunition depot, apparently. It was completely blown to smithereens, leaving a huge crater that you can see here in these images that have been posted on Twitter. Um, the United States said it had nothing to do with that attack on Saturday. Um, Israel hasn't said anything, um, and I don't know. But uh, given the situation, um, it beggars belief that uh, you know that nobody was involved in this, and obviously Israel uh, had reason and justification for attacking this base, since it is the site of repeated assaults against Israel from uh, from uh, from Iraq. Um, at any rate, this brings us to Iran. What happened in Iran? So what was struck in Iran, initial reports that uh, came through were that Israel attacked an air base in Isfahan, where Iran houses its F-14 uh, uh, jets. And we should remember that, although the Russians have promised the Iranians to, uh, to sell the Iranian Sukhoi uh, 35s, which are their uh, advanced fighter jets. And actually, there was a report that came out today that Russia is going to uh, deliver these uh, these fourth generation fighter jets to Iran this week. Um, it's not clear that Iran has pilots. It's not clear who would pilot them. It's not clear uh, how old they are, or how usable they are. At any rate, um, Iran has not had a modernization of its air force since the 1979 revolution. It's not considered to be that uh, great. If you've seen uh, um, if you've seen uh, Maverick, uh, the uh, top, the new Top Gun movie that came out in 2021 or whatever, uh, Tom Cruise takes on uh, takes these uh, takes an F-14 uh, from uh, an Iranian hangar, and you sort of see the way that they look, and that's true that Iran simply has an unmodern, a non-modernized air force. Uh, so it was a strange target to take out. Why would you take out this weak link in Iran's military? But then it worked out. On Saturday, it was reported that actually what was hit was not the air base itself, but rather the Russian uh, advanced uh, S-300 uh, anti uh, the surface-to-air missile uh, battery uh, that was located adjacent to the Air Force base housing the F-14. So what uh, was apparently taken out, and you can see here uh, some of the pictures, uh, was a uh, was an S-300. Uh, battery. Um, and that battery was important because what it protects is the uh, Iranian nuclear facility in Nantaz. And the nuclear facility in Nantaz is one of Iran's key nuclear facilities. Uh, they actually, after it had been penetrated several times and sabotaged you know, its uranium and uh, centrifuges for enriching uranium, the Iranians built it into a hardened, uh, into a hardened, um, target the inside of the Zagros Mountains so that it was supposed to be impenetrable even to bunker busters. And it's a key component of Iran's nuclear uh, nuclear program because that's where they enrich uranium uh, to very high levels. They've already reached the capacity to build bomb-grade uranium. And so um, the S-300 battery that was apparently attacked, that was apparently uh, uh, destroyed, or, or the key component of it was at any rate, um, it was protecting the Nantan's uh, nuclear reactor. So uh, that's important. It's also important the ordinance that Israel reportedly used in the strike. So in this uh, report you see here, um, the Israelis used one of two kinds of ballistic missiles that were shot from an F-15 over Iraq, over Baghdad, about 600 kilometers to its target in Isfahan in Iran. And so um, the two, uh, and, and they know this from the fuel tanks that were discarded that were found inside of Iraq. So Israel at no time penetrated. Its, its jets did not enter Iranian airspace. But according to the reports, what happened was that Ira Israeli F-15s, I think that's what it's been reported anyway, shot these ballistic missiles into Iran from Iraq. And there are two kinds of ballistic missiles that Israel may have used. One is the Sparrow uh, ballistic missiles. The Sparrows were developed um, as a missile to test the Arrow uh, anti-ballistic missile missiles that shoot down ballistic missiles. They were used, of course, to great effect on April 13th in destroying 
the incoming Iranian ballistic missiles uh, into Israel. Um, and um, so the Sparrows, there are three different kinds of Sparrow missiles that were developed by, by uh, Rafael, the Israeli military uh, manufactured missile developer, and they were and they were apparently, or one of the one of the hypotheses is that a, a Sparrow missile was used to attack um, in Isfahan. The other is that a uh, a different kind of missile called ROX, which Rafael also developed, may have been used rather than a Sparrow ballistic missile to attack. And uh, some of the reports that I've seen, and this is all based on open intelligence um, reviews of the of the warheads um, as they've been advertised by Rafael over the years, and also the Sten fuel tanks, and also how the S three hundred was attacked, and how Iran was penetrated without alerting any of Iran's early warning systems that they were being penetrated by missiles from Iraq, from, you know, attacked uh, by Israel from Iraq, um, was that the ROCKS missile, unbeknownst to any of us until uh, now, and again, this is one of the hypotheses that may or may not be true, but actually that the ROCKS missile is a hypersonic missile that's capable of flying at hypersonic speeds, and that the warhead used um, by the ROCKS missile that was shot allegedly at Iran was actually uh, penetrative, uh, bunker-penetrating uh, warhead, meaning that Israel does have the capacity to penetrate hardened targets, including the Lantaz nuclear facility, among other things. The message that Israel sent with this uh, response was interesting, because again, it wasn't that the nuclear sites were attacked, they weren't attacked. What was attacked was the radar in Syria, Apparently, an IRGC target in Iraq, and maybe uh, the Shiite uh, military force that's controlled by Iran that's been attacking Israel since October 7th uh, was bombed by Israel. Maybe it just uh, blew up on its own because of all of the unexploded ordnance that was uh, located there. And you could see from the bomb blast just how enormous that, uh, <laughs> uh, that, uh, that, ammunition cache was. Um, and then inside of Iraq, the, I mean, inside of Iran, the S-300 uh, battery in Isfahan that protects Nanta. So all of these targets, particularly the three that we, uh, that have been reported, that have been attributed to Israel specifically, and that were all hit on, uh, in the early morning hours of Friday, um, the, the, this wasn't just a little, you know, uh, tap on your roof. It wasn't saying, you know, watch out, don't mess with us again. It was saying, this is what we can do. It was uh, it was demonstration of capabilities. It was saying two things to Iran. One is, you're an open book to us. We know you like the palm of our hands. We know everything that you have. We know what's defending what. Uh, we can penetrate you. We have the capacity. There were reports that some of the there were some reports that the attack in Nantaz and that there were other attacks inside of Iran that were carried out by quadcopters um, a, a deployed by the Mossad inside of Iran. Um, and if these are true, that's more information that Israel both is capable of operating essentially at will inside of Iran. It has the capability of doing so, and also that it's capable of attacking Iran from outside of Iran uh, fairly easily without any detection by the Iranian early warning sensors. So these these are this is very important, and I think that the Iranian response has been uh, suitably panicked. You know, they've come out with a whole bunch of different confused messages. Nothing happened. Nothing was attacked. Israel didn't attack anything. Israel is a loser. Israel wasn't able to cause any damage. The Mossad did it. The Mossad is terrible. They're all powerful. It's conspiracy against the the Iranian people. Um, and and uh, all kinds of other things. So the Mossad did it. Nobody did it. We don't know if we were attacked. We weren't attacked. Um, all of these things. Oh, the the National Security Council met. The Supreme National Security Council, whatever met. No, no, no. They didn't. There was no meeting. Nobody's worried about anything. Nobody met. So they, these were the kinds of confused Iranian responses that you know that that people who understand Iran say you know indicate some massive panic on the part of the regime that they see that they're exposed. And that Israel has the capacity to harm the, their nuclear 
installations in a way that they never imagined Israel could do, and to do it on its own, because clearly the United States wasn't involved in anything that Israel did. And the other thing that Israel communicated to the United States was, look, you know, <laughs> uh, fine, we did our thing, you know, we did our bit. Um, and and notably, um, uh, the same morning, uh, three Israeli C-130 cargo uh, planes landed at Ramstein Air Base, U.S. Air Base in Germany, to pick up stuff. And Biden also announced an additional $1 billion worth of uh, 155 millimeter uh, tank shells were going to be delivered to Israel. And and when we look at this, we have to remember that the United States has been apparently, reportedly slow walking the transfer of key munitions to Israel ahead of Israel's planned operation in Rafa, which we've talked about at great length and we're probably going to revisit in the weeks to come, and of course in Lebanon. And so it would seem that after this demonstration of massive capabilities that it placed Iran in panic, or the United States finally relented and gave Israel the critical supplies that it had been reportedly uh, slow walking and denying Israel ahead of any planned operation in Rafah to try to prevent Israel from carrying out this uh, vital military operation to defeat Hamas. So if that was the deal, and to me it seems like it was the deal, um, it was a likely deal, then Israel, then this was a win-win for Israel. Israel was able to terrify the Iranians. Now, there have been reports uh, since uh, since Friday that Iran is saying that they're revisiting their nuclear policies, um, but they've been saying that for a while. On April 7th, um, an Iranian nuclear scientist named Mahmoud Riza Al-Gamiri, this was a memory report that came out, I think, last week. He's the president of Behishti University in Iran, and he gave us he gave an interview to Iranian television on April 7th saying, look, you know, our policy uh, is based on a fatwa that Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei put out, you know, decades ago saying that Islam prevents the use of nuclear weapons. The fact is, though, that he's an Islamic jurist, and just as he made that decision back then, he can change it anytime he wants. It's totally within his power. And, you know, we've already completed the nuclear the nuclear um, fuel cycle, and our, we have massive nuclear capabilities, etc. So what he was saying was, we're about to test a nuclear weapon, uh, Khamenei is about to sanction the use of nuclear weapons, but now that, and, and now they're signaling that that may in fact happen. Um, but they also just got a big signal from Israel, which said, you know, our finger is on the trigger. We know exactly where all your stuff is. We know how to hit it. We have the capacity to hit it. We just showed you that capacity. Make our day. The truth of the matter is that the cat is out of the bag, right? I mean, Iran is a threshold nuclear state, according to the IAEA and the International Atomic Energy Agency of the UN, the monitors. So what are we talking about here? I mean, it's really just, you can't contain these people. We saw that on October 7th. There's no containing genocidal maniacs who want to world the world in the name of Islam and are operating proxies throughout the region of the world in order to advance that agenda. So obviously, you know, well, you know, the gun that you put on the on the table in Act 1, it's going to be used in Act 3, right? So, I mean, that's basically where we are today. And it's just a question of who who wins the war. And, I mean, a war that we're very much into. And then this brings us, um, you know, to the second story that I wanted to talk. So, I, I anyway, I, I, I was skeptical. I was very worried, you know, that we would do a little saber rattling and look really dumb. And we definitely don't look dumb. We look very powerful. We are very powerful. We've shown them that we're very powerful. I think it also, by the way, sent a very important message to the Israeli people that, look, you know, we don't have to be in a state of panic. There are a lot of things that we can do. We're capable. We just hit Iran. This was not hard. You know, we barely broke into a sweat. Like, we can do this. And that, I think, was really important. I say that as an Israeli who who was just like everybody else, especially after April 13th, it's very, very worried. I mean, we can't have that kind of a defensive posture. I mean, yes, we successfully blocked those missiles from coming in, but hello, right? There were 300 of them and just blocking them cost us billions of dollars. Those missiles we shot off, the Aero missiles, you know, they cost millions of dollars a piece, right? You shoot us with 300, that's billions of dollars that we have to pay in order to defend ourselves. So that's, you know, that that's something we can't do every day. We can't do it, you know, 
often. And especially when we're fighting a massively expensive war and we keep having to get resupplied by the United States, massively expand our own production lines, it's hard. You know, this is, we can't win this war on defense. We have to, we can only win it on offense. So I think it was, it was a very important thing. And I, I want to move to the second story because it's so shocking and it's new and, and probably very few people are talking about it or far fewer people are talking about that than are talking about the Iran story. And, and that's a story that was carried, that was carried in Axios by Barack Ravid was very, very close to the State Department, and they use him always as a signaler of messaging of nasty things that they're going to do to Israel or to uh, defend nasty things that they do to Israel. Anyway, so Barack Ravid came out with this story on Saturday night where he said that Secretary of State Tony Blinken is about to put sanctions on an IDF military unit. If you remember, on February 1st, uh, President Biden issued this um, executive order uh, uh, singling out Jews in Judea and Samaria um, who are accused but never proven and never indicted or charged or arrested, but whatever, um, of violence against uh, Palestinians and making them the target of sanctions. And just on Friday, they sanctioned, I think, another three Israelis and two Israeli organizations uh, claiming that they were involved in a settler violence against the Palestinians. You know, again, no no arrests, no indictment, no proof of charges, no nothing. We're just going to sanction all of these groups. I mean, you know, one of them is involved in in saving Israeli Jews, Jewish girls who are brought into, you know, marriages with Palestinian uh, Muslim men, and then they're mistreated um, by their husbands, and they call out for help and these people send in people to to redeem them to rescue them and bring them back uh, to their families so i mean so this organization was just sanctioned for being a violent settler organization whatever so i mean a lot of these groups you know not clear you might not like what they do but or what they stand for but it, it, you know lots of different groups do a lot of different things and they're not sanctioned by anybody because nothing that they do is illegal um at any rate, so now this report just came out in Axios that the State Department is planning on sanctioning an entire unit in the IDF called Netzach Yuda. This is a unit that was formed for ultra-Orthodox Israeli Jews who seek to uh, serve in the military. And what's interesting, of course, is that Israel right now is embroiled in, uh, in a manufactured fight that the left is using to try to destabilize the Netanyahu government to force the government to begin conscripting ultra-Orthodox Jews who were receiving since 1948 deferments from IDF service because their uh, main occupation is studying Torah. And it's sort of a uh, an agreement that was reached between David Ben-Gurion and the chief rabbis of Israel, or the heads of the yeshivot in Israel, uh, when Israel was established, that in order to protect terrorist stu Torah study, especially after the Holocaust, that these ultra-Orthodox Jews whose uh, life was studying of Torah would be would receive deferment from military service. At any rate, there's been a big movement reasonably over the years because the number of yeshiva students in North Alto Orthodox yeshivas is no longer, you know, a couple thousand. Now it's, you know, many, many thousands. And so the obvious inequality here between them and the rest of the 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 people of Israel is is obvious and glaring. So there's been, you know, a big internal effort to increase conscription rates among ultra Orthodox men. Some want to do it through a political process of give and take, some want to do it, the left wants to do it through judicial fiat um, to try to destabilize the right-wing coalition and turn the ultra-Orthodox against their partners and the Likud and other right-wing parties, etc. So a lot of stuff going on, but there is an underlining issue. So Netzach Yehuda was a, a unit that was formed, it's an infantry unit that was based largely in the Jordan Valley in Judea and Samaria until it was moved to the Golan Heights four months ago. Um, and it was an organic unit of all uh, Orthodox Jews, many of them ultra-Orthodox, some of them sort of on the spectrum of ultra-Orthodoxy, serving uh, together in an all-male unit um, to enable them to continue to carry out their very religious uh, lifestyle while serving as a combat unit in the IDF. So it's funny because the same left-wing activists who have been agitating for ultra-Orthodox conscription have also for the past several years been demonizing the Netzach Yehuda unit, which was formed and able to enable 
in order to enable the very conscription that they're demanding, right? And so they've been they've been demonizing it because they hate religious Jews, they hate they hate right wing Jews, and you know religious Jews, especially ultra orthodox Jews, tend to be quite nationalist, quite quite uh, quite right wing in their views and in their understanding that Judea and Samaria is the cradle of Jewish civilization and that Israel should not make any territorial compromises in this area. So they've been demonizing them. And when Biden came into office, he'd be his State Department, led by Hadi Amar, the uh, Hamas enthusiast who's in charge of U.S. policy towards the Palestinians from the State Department, along with Tony Blinken, have adopted the Israeli anti-religious policy as American policy, as U.S. policy, and they've made statements over the past three years demonizing that Safi would die as well for doing its job carrying out counter-terrorist operations. And one of them, an 80-year-old American Palestinian, was killed. So that means that they're all terrorists, right? No, it doesn't. But anyway, um, so this report came out that the United States is planning on designating an entire Israeli military unit or sanctioning an entire unit in the Israeli army. And that means, according to the report, that um, the United States, what does it say here? Um, that under the sanctions, it will ban its soldiers and officers from training with the U.S. military. Of course, the United States military trains the Palestinian Authority security forces, which, I, as I explained in great detail in a previous uh, episode of this show, based on our report, a detailed report that was put out by uh, the Regovim uh, organization, their, their members have carried out 70 terrorist attacks many of them deadly terrorist attacks against Israelis just over the past three years. And many, many of the attacks that have been carried out since February 29th have been carried out repeatedly and most prominently by Palestinian authorities, security forces that are trained by the U.S. military. At any rate, the United States wants to sanction Netzach Yehuda and ban it from having any cooperation with the U.S. military. They only are able to cooperate and trade uh, Palestinian terrorists, apparently. And they're also not allowed to participate in any actions that are funded by the United States or to receive U.S. assistance of any kind, which receivably means that they're not allowed to use U.S. Uh, US arms or bullets or anything. So, you know, assault weapons, uh, whatever. So that's that's incredible that the United States would be doing this. And so, you know, the first thing that I think that it's important to say about this, this is an anti-Semitic action. I mean, this is an... This is a, a unit of Orthodox Jews, and you're sanctioning it, even though, you know, every unit that carries out counterterrorism operations in Judea and Sumeria carries out similar similar operations that Netzach Yehuda uh, carried out and is being sanctioned for. So essentially, you're casting a unit of religious Jews, and this is discriminatory, and it's discriminatory against a specific kind of Jews, Orthodox Jews, which makes it specifically anti-Semitic. And so it's an anti-Semitic action if it's carried out. It's also an action that's carried out against an official body of the state of Israel, the Israeli army, the Israeli defense forces. You're, you're, you're sanctioning a unit inside of an allied military. This is, this is sort of crossing the Rubicon. This is a rupture. This is the rupture that I was worried about, uh, and it's being provoked here uh, because they think that this will pass political muster, that this is going to be okay because of religious Jews and you know, so many people have been groomed to believe that there's something terribly wrong about religious Jews and have been, been desensitized to the idea that there's something wrong with, with hating religious Jews and, 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 and hunting them, you know, and, and specifically targeting them. And, and, and that's, a, that's a big problem, right? And so they think that they can get away with it, but this is an extremely anti-Semitic action, and it's also crossing the Rubicon in terms of being a, an open breach of relations between United States and Israel. I mean, can you imagine if Israel said that they were going to have nothing to do with the, you know, the 101st Airborne or, you know, the Green Berets or, you know, any unit in the U.S. military, the 3rd Infantry Division? It, it It's it's a shocking move. This is an official unit of the IDF, which is obviously the army of the state of Israel, which is a U.S. ally, which Joe Biden just pledged yet again to always stand on the side of. And here you are sanctioning a unit in the Israeli army for doing nothing. And so, you know, and with no due process and with no do nothing. And uh, I think, you know, Israel has to respond uh, just to the threat of doing this. And it has to say, you know, this is something that 
Israel is not going to be able to stand for. But if the United States does, in fact, go through with this, then Israel is going to ban all U.S. diplomatic personnel from crossing the 1949 armistice lines and operating in Judea and Samaria. They're going to be banned. Like, no U.S. embassy officials are going to be able to operate in Judea and Samaria any longer. I think I think that's fair. I think that would be a fair response to this. And I think it would be a fair thing for Israel to say to the United States, whether publicly or privately, because obviously they they leaked this to Barack Ravid in order to make it public. And so Israel can leak back to Barack Ravid or use another uh, media organ or just say in private communications with Blinken, if you go forward with this, we are going to ban your personnel from operating in Judea and Samaria, period. And uh, moreover, we're going to arrest every Palestinian Authority, you know, uh, personnel that incites against Jews, incites for terrorism, is engaged in any way, shape or form in terrorism. And also one more thing, we're going to stop. This is something that uh, Finance Minister Batsala Smotrich threatened to do. And I think we should just do it now. You know, ban the Palestinian Authority from using the Israeli banking system. This is a terrorist authority. It is directly engaged in terrorism. It funds terrorism. It sponsors terrorism. It celebrates terrorism. It grooms its people to become terrorists. It is a terrorist organization. And therefore, it should be banned from the banking system, certainly Israel's banking system. And it should be banned. And Israel should not allow Israeli Israeli banks, the government of Israel, from transferring any funds to the Palestinian Authority. So, I mean, I think that these are actions that are required in the face of this unprecedented threat to sanction a unit in the Israeli military. This simply cannot stand. And I think I think it's important to understand just how noxious this action is. I also think it's really important for Congress to start having hearings on the way that the State Department is, is abusing uh, the Israeli military, demonizing, delegitimizing the Israeli military, and that you know this 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 threat of sanctions against a U.S. Uh, against an Israeli military unit by the State Department is just you know an uh, an upgrade of that. But you know the Samantha Power is accusing us of 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 fomenting a famine in northern Gaza. This is pure lies. This is a blood libel, right? I mean, I've written about this. I think I've spoken about it before. And I think that this is something that, you know, deserves to be held under a spotlight by the by the House Foreign Relations Committee. I mean, it it is shocking that they're saying these kinds of things. They're lies. And that also just promotes anti-Semitism because when you have senior US officials making these kinds of statements, it, you know, it it's sort of it, it's a part of the feeding chain about the food in, food chain that ends up enabling and legitimizing anti-Jewish assaults throughout the United States, whether it's on Columbia campuses, uh, you know, South Lawn, where they're having these Gaza sit-ins where, that are terrorizing Jewish students that are now going to be planned for, you know, to, to be carried out all over the United States or, you know, on, on the streets of New York City where you have people praising Hezbollah. I mean, where is this coming from? Well, it's certainly being legitimized by a State Department, by an administration that is demonizing Israel and accusing Israel falsely of deliberately starving people in Gaza or carpet bombing them or whatever else that they say, which is just a lie. And now here, sanctioning an entire unit in the IDF for nothing, for carrying out counterterrorist operations. This just, I mean, this is the kind of thing that just can't pass you know, with with no comment on Israel side. So that's, you know, that's that. And now now I want to just move uh, to the third issue, the third issue, the third subject that I wanted to talk about today. And I know my producers will be like, Carol, we wanted you to keep it short. So I just want to say a couple of things because we're going into Passover and JNS is going to be taking a breather to let us all kind of enjoy our festival of freedom for a little while. So I think this show is probably going to go on a hiatus for a little while. Uh, just a little while. I promise I'll be back. And if there's any big deal, then I'll force my producers to uh, uh, post another video. But but in the meantime, I just wanted to give you some thoughts on on passive. Um, you know, here we are in the midst of a war for our national survival. And there are some serious lessons that we have to take from Passover. Um, you know, what, what happened in Egypt um, 30, 3,300 years ago? I mean, what, what happened 
was that you had the greatest demonstration of God and the introduction of the concept of human freedom into human history. And I, I think that the exodus from Egypt, the deliverance of a nation of slaves, the Jewish people, from uh, bondage at the hands of the most powerful uh, empire that humanity had seen until then, the Egyptian empire, the pharaoh of Egypt, the all-powerful, the god-man, right, um, that was destroyed by God as he delivered a nation of slaves into freedom through signs and wonders, through miracles beyond beyond measure, obviously culminating in the in the in the parting of the Red Sea uh, with the, with the children of Israel walking on dry land and the and the army of Pharaoh being swallowed up. It's an extraordinary thing. And and what the Bible is is clear about as well is when they talk about uh when they when they give the when they give the story, when they when in the narrative of the Exodus, immediately after the children of Israel leave Egypt, what happens? It's assaulted. It's attacked by the by the by the Amalekites, by Amalek. And um, they're tired and they're weak. And the Amalekites attack the people in the back, the rear, you know, the kibbutzim, Be'eri, Kfar Aza, Nir'am, right, that are right at the border and they're populated by children and women and old people standing on bus stops waiting for a day of fun in, in the Dead Sea, only to be mowed down, right, or, or young people dancing at a rave in the desert, uh, and, and and the Amalekites attack the children of Israel that had just gone through this incredible deliverance at the hand of God, and they're tired, you know, and, and they're overwhelmed, and they're slaves, and they're weak, and they get attacked. And, you know, and, and God, of course, uh, uh, Moses leads them in war, and God delivers them, and then God says to the children of Israel, says that you have to annihilate Amalek, that this is my command to you, that you must wipe Amalek off the face of the planet. That is your job as the children of Israel. And the question is why, right? I mean, why is it that the Amalekites have to be limited and say not the Egyptians, right? You've been through forced labor, you were in bondage in Israel, in Egypt for 200 odd years. Why is it the Amalekites and, and, uh, and uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, the late chief rabbi of Britain, gave an answer. He said, you know, like it or not, Pharaoh had a case, right? And when the Jews came in, they started taking over Egypt. He was afraid of them, so he enslaved them. He made them weak. He was afraid of them. They had a lot of babies. He threw all their kids into the Nile. But it was like they were there in his land, and he was threatened. But the Amalekites had no beef with the children of Israel. I mean, nobody had ever done anything to them. So why why did they want to annihilate the children of Israel? Why did they want to annihilate the slave nation that God had just delivered? And the answer is two. I think, you know, the first is, of course, they want to deny the existence of God. And what's the weak link in this chain between God and his chosen people? Obviously, the chosen people. I mean, how do you attack God? You attack God by attacking the Jews. If you can annihilate the Jews, then you annihilate the God that just delivered them, right? So that's the first thing. And and then it was it was a twofold attack. It was an, it, it, the the threat of the Amalekites is twofold. The first one, obviously, is physical annihilation. The, the second threat that the Amalekites posed to the children of Israel then and today as well is that they they insinuated doubt into the heart of the Jews, where they said, and, you know, made them think that God wasn't all power. And that they really weren't that great or chosen or worthy of of being delivered from bondage. And, and so it was like this dual thing. It was both making the Jews not believe in themselves and also make humanity not believe in God. And if the Jews who are just delivered don't believe in their own right to freedom, then why would anybody believe in freedom? I mean, the Jews are sort of the the, the apotheosis of human freedom because they were delivered to freedom by God Almighty. And so if the Jews reject freedom, 
right? If they, they reject their position as a free nation that was freed from bondage by God, then there is no freedom. And if, and if the Jews are annihilated, then there is no God. So it's a, the threat of, of Amalek is both physical and spiritual. And that's why God said, you have to wipe them off the face of the earth. Because if, if freedom is to survive, well, the Jews must survive. And, and to survive, the Jews have to eliminate doubt about their worthiness for freedom. And, you know, I think, I think it's obvious that the Amalekites have been afflicting the Jews ever since. And I would also argue that it's not, it's not, uh, it, it's not, it's not surprising that one of the principal proofs that the South Africans brought before the kangaroo court of the International Fake Court of Justice at The Hague last, when was it that they opened their, their ridiculous trial against Israel earlier this year for genocide? Um, they said the proof that Israel is carrying out genocide is that the prime minister and other Israeli senior officials have referred to uh, Hamas as the Amalekites and said that we're going to wipe them off the face of the coin or whatever it is that they said. And yeah, right. So, so they're saying that the fact that Israel is likening Hamas, which is doing exactly right what the, what the Amalekites did to the children of Israel in the desert, um, that that likening, that parallel, that comparison of the two uh, is a, is an is a declaration of genocidal intent, and therefore Israel deserves criticism. It doesn't matter, right, anything that Hamas calls for the annihilation of Jews and that it, in fact, carried out a day of genocide on October 7th, or that it continues to carry out acts of genocide by holding the hostages and etc. None of that is important. What's important that is that Israel defying this battle as both a physical battle and a spiritual battle uh, after what happened on October 7th. We're not allowed to do that. That in and of itself is proof of genocidal intent uh, for Israel. So I, I think, you know, Zan and the BDS movements and the this and the that and the other, they show that the, that the divine commandment to the children of Israel after they came out of Egypt it remains in force. That you know, now we are engaged in a war that will determine the survival not only of the Jewish state, and as we see with the assaults on Jews throughout the world since October 7th, indeed the Jewish people everywhere, but it's also going to determine the future of, of freedom. Because for the past 3,300 years since that moment in Egyptian history, that moment in human history, of the exodus from Egypt. We have had freedom in humanity and made its first appearance there officially. And since then, humanity has been reckoning with the price and the blessings of freedom and whether freedom was worth the price that we need to pay. And the price is both physical, that we need to fight for freedom physically on the battlefield, and it's also spiritual, that we have to be capable of understanding the, the, the importance of freedom, the, the beauty of freedom, the preciousness of freedom to ourselves, to our families, to our peoples, and to believe that we have the right to it. And that, that willingness to fight the spiritual battle, the battle of ideas, the political battle, the cultural battle to maintain freedom, because just as the Jews were attacked by the Amalekites in the desert, the moment that they emerged as a free people after being delivered by the by the Almighty God, so everywhere, freedom is challenged not only physically but also spiritually. So I think that this battle is pivotal. It's it's another pivotal moment in the history of humanity. And we may look back at it and realize that it's it's nearly as important as that moment 3,300 years ago at the Red Sea. I, I believe we're living in those kinds of times today, and and 
you know, we have to be willing to accept the price and to fight at all costs to preserve our freedom today and to fight for it on every battlefield and to win those battles because everything is on the line. Anyway, everybody should have a hug some mass because share, enjoy it with your family, with your friends, with your people. Let's celebrate it and let's move forward and continue to defend our people, our nation, and our freedom. Ami Slanfai. See you soon.